Hi, this is Ben Scrivens, creator and owner of Fright Rags, and you are listening to The Graveyard Show. Welcome to The Graveyard. And welcome to another edition of the Graveyard Show podcast. I am your caretaker and the graveyard is open. Well, summer is in the rearview mirror as we uh, start prepping for Halloween. October is very close and we are in that time of year. Our time of year, of course, being fans of horror um, and sci-fi and all things macabre. this is, uh, this is our time of year, so I hope all of you are having a good time getting ready for the Halloween season. Uh, I'm happy because um, my guest for this show is the man you heard at the top of the program, Mr. Ben Scrivens. He's the creator, owner, president of Fright Rags, uh, the great horror apparel and accessories company. Uh, you can uh, check them out at FrightRags.com. That's F-R-I-G-H-T hyphen R-A-G-S, FrightRags.com. I'm sure most, if not all of you, already know about it, but if you don't, don't know about uh, the website and the clothing and uh, other apparel, go check it out. Uh, This interview I'm loving because we're really going to get into the whole uh, starting a business, what it was like creating a business, uh, what things he didn't expect, um, sort of like pitfalls uh, that kind of happened. It's great. You're going to love it. And um, if uh, if you're a fan of horror, you're going to love it. And if you're trying to uh, figure out maybe uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur, Take a listen because he's done it and um, he's someone that you should definitely listen to when it comes to um, what it's like to get your own business off the ground. Uh, I just want to quickly get to some business uh, that I wasn't able to in the previous uh, podcast. Um, I want to talk about the film Bottle Monster. Back uh, for Tombstone number 18. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going a little bit back here. Uh, I had uh, director Marjorie DeHay and producer Paul Overacker uh, on the program, and they were promoting their film Bottle Monster. And um, the film is now available uh, to, uh, to watch, and I believe it's also available to purchase. So um, I just wanted to mention a couple of the sites where you can go to to get the film. Uh, you can go to iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Redbox, Vudu, and Xbox. That's where you can find uh, the film to watch. And uh, if you want to learn more about the movie, you can also go to the official website, which is BottleMonsterFilm.com. That is BottleMonsterFilm.com. And in some other news that just came out, uh, Beyond Fest has just announced uh, its full slate of films for uh, the return of uh, LA's biggest genre film festival. Um, The uh, Beyond Fest is going to have uh, the U.S. premiere of Halloween Kills, which, of course, everybody's waiting to see. Uh, The West Coast premieres of The Black Phone, Lamb, Vortex, and the Palme d'Or winner, uh, Tatane, on 35mm film. Wow, that's cool. Uh, It's going to also have the world premiere of New York Ninja and the 50th anniversary of the film A Clockwork Orange, as well as a salute to uh, legendary uh, director Michael Mann. So Beyond Fest is going to return uh, to theaters for a 10-day run. It's going to start uh, Wednesday, September 29th, and it's going to run through Monday, October 11th. Uh, Beyond Fest is uh, built in partnership with the American Cinematheque. Um, It will screen at uh, the Legion Theater. Uh, the Aero Theater, been there many times, and Los Feliz 3. And all ticket sales are going to go to the 501c3 nonprofit film institution. Now, very important, if you are going to go, attendance to all screenings will require proof of uh, vaccination, obviously for COVID, and guests will have to follow mandatory mask mandates. For more information, uh, you can go to beyondfest.com. You can follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Really quickly, I mean, there are a bunch of movies uh, on here, and I'm just going to quickly run through a few of them. Obviously, as I said, Halloween Kills, which, of course, everyone can't wait to see. Uh, Lamb, New York Ninja, uh, Freddy vs. Jason will be playing. Uh, as well with uh, the writers of the film, Mark Swift and uh, Damien Shannon uh, will be there in person. Uh, You're Next. Uh, Evil Dead the Remake, that will be screened. Uh, VHS 94, uh, the original VHS, uh, Starship Troopers, uh, and then obviously for Michael Mann, his films Collateral, Thief, 
uh, will be uh, screened. Um, there's just, <laughs> there's really just a ton of movies. I'm scrolling through this and also Tombs of the Blind Dead. Love that movie. Very underrated, I think. Um, and let's see, let's see what else is being uh, shown here. I mean, I'm just, I'm just scrolling through. Uh, there are so many movies here uh, that are being screened. Uh, Babadook is going to be screened. Uh, the 19, uh, I'm sorry, the 2012 uh, Maniac will be screened as well. Uh, so again, uh, beyondfest.com is where you can go. Uh, tickets are going to be on sale via Evan Bright starting September 17th at, at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. And uh, again, beyondfest.com is where to go. You can also check it out at American Cinema Tech. Um, it just, it's great to see uh, events starting to come back in person, even though we have to still wear these masks. Um, it's great to see people out and about and um, just starting to get life back in order again from um, the dreadful 2020 that we've all lived through. And if you end up going to it and you want to share your experience, please feel free to reach out. Uh, again, on Slasher at Graveyard Show Podcast is the handle as well as GYS Podcast at gmail.com being the email address. Okay, so there you go. Some uh, rare news at the top of the show. Uh, well, as you hear in the background, uh, New Grave is being added. And when that happens, that can only mean one thing. My guest is here and it's time for me to get to work. Well, if you are a fan of horror apparel and accessories, then you know all about Fright Rags, which has been your premier source since 2003. Ben Scrivens is the owner and president of Fright Rags, and it is a real pleasure welcoming him to the graveyard. Ben, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, it's great to have you here. I've been wanting to have you on the program for the longest time, and it's uh, it's great to have you here. Um, and um, before we get into Fright Rags, though, um, I wanted to touch on when you uh, first became a horror fan, because obviously there's a great love of horror for you uh, to have created Fright Rags. So what was that spark that got you interested in horror? Uh, well, it was actually almost exactly 40 years ago, <laughs> uh, which is really, really odd to say that something could have happened 40 years ago that I remember, but it's true. Um, it was October 30th, 1981. Um, we, I lived uh, down in the, we, we live in Rochester, New York. This is where I was born and raised. And okay. we, uh, my family at the time lived uh, in the city and um, we had good friends that owned a deli uh, and they lived in like behind and up above the deli too. It was like one of those like family run stores yep, and stuff. So sure. we, I, I'm the youngest of four. Uh, I have two brothers and a sister. They're all older than me, uh, 10 years, eight years and five years older than me. So I'm the baby. Right. So we all go to their house to hang out. Um, our friend's house there behind the deli and all the kids are playing like they're all older than me. So they're all kind of going off to do their own thing. And I'm four years old and I'm kind of bored and my parents were talking, playing cards, whatever. And I was just begging them to go home. And my mom was just like, just go watch TV. Just like go sit down and watch TV. <laughs> Classic eighties mom yep. thing. Right. <laughs> and you know, I, I just went over to the TV. I sat down and turned it on. I was probably, you know, 10 inches from it or something. And of course there was only three channels yep. and uh, I turned it over to NBC and it was the network premiere of Halloween. And uh, again, you know, I didn't know that at the time. I was four years old. You know, I didn't know what I was doing or watching. I just putting something on TV. Yeah. And uh, it, come to find out, it was the network TV premiere of uh, of of Halloween. So I sat and watched it by myself. Um, and I, from then on, it's funny. Whenever I recall that experience, I mean, I was four, so you know, it's sure. very fuzzy. You know, and for a long time, I actually thought it was on Halloween, and then I ended up getting the TV guide, and it was actually the night before. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Um, so I don't remember being scared, but I do remember being affected. I mean, up until then, it was Scooby Doo and Popeye, and mm -hmm. you know, other cartoons, and and I had seen obviously regular television, but when watching somebody try to kill somebody and break through the closet and then the mask and all that it really just it like did something to my brain like it rewired it and so i just really wanted to see more of that after that point <laughs> just wanted to whatever that was and then you know that led into you know home video and in the early days of home video so going to the movies uh you know the the rental stores and and checking out the horror section and and just looking for something like halloween you know became what i wanted to do sure 
That's, a, that's so interesting because I remember um, one of the things that, well, one of the times where I was really scared. I mean, I can't believe you were, you know, for watching Halloween and, and you were good with that because I remember when I was a kid, <laughs> um, vividly remembering, I was home with my dad. My dad was working on something down in the basement. I'm, I'm a Jersey, Jersey boy. So, um, so he was downstairs in the basement and I'm upstairs and I was probably around, I guess I was probably around the same age as you were when you saw Halloween and there was a commercial on for, uh, the original Phantom of the Opera, Lon Chaney, Mm. Lon Chaney. And, and I was so scared (laughs) that (laughs) I ran into the kitchen and I hid where the refrigerator was was the wall it was like a little area there that I could hide in and it just scared me and that's where my love of horror <laughs> became <laughs> that's awesome yeah, it's, it's yeah, yeah it's so funny I remember watching Halloween when it came on as well that time and it was scary but um, it's it's so interesting how horror can affect us in different ways right so for you it wasn't so much the scare it was everything that you're seeing and you're and you're and you're absorbing it um, so um, like I know for me um, Salem's Lot. That was another one that scared the hell mm-hmm. out of us when that was on. That was a two nighter, and man, that just affected my, myself and my friend. We were like going nuts, and he he came over to watch it, and he just ran home that night, hoping the vampires wouldn't catch him. <laughs> um, but at least um, he wasn't floating outside your window. Exa- later, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I'm curious then. So as you found, as you discovered this love of Halloween. How did you kind of go? Did you go back to the classics to find stuff, or as or as a child of the '80s, were you like just going for every new thing that was coming out, Friday the Thirteenth and and Nightmare on Elm Street and that kind of thing? Yeah, it was basically going after the new stuff. So you know, my and again, like when I first saw Halloween at four, I, I don't again, I don't remember being like scared, but when I saw it later, like as I got a little older, I was absolutely terrified of it. I just don't think I had context when I was four, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, granted, not that there's much context needed when someone's chasing somebody, but I just think I was like, just like amazed by what I was watching. But I, I really gravitated toward newer horror at the time um, because it was just, you know, going to the, the movie store and like I said, just looking up i just wanted to see someone with a mask killing people like like teens or whatever you know yeah, what i mean and yep. so that, then of course that led to friday 13th and then when nightmare on elm street came out and, and hearing about that and wanting to see that of course you know being in the heyday of the 80s you would see the commercials and you would read fangoria so it was a lot of the newer stuff i did begin to delve into a little bit of the classics as they were on tv i would you know sneak downstairs um my mom, my parents were actually pretty cool about me watching stuff but then they would, you know, sometimes, you know, obviously I couldn't be up too late to watch it or whatever. But by the time I was nine, they had signed the back of my uh, rental card, the one that I used to go to all the time. So it was sure. like a mile from my house. They signed the back because they were getting tired of them constantly getting asked <laughs> if it was OK <laughs> for me to rent rented. it. Yep. <laughs> so I had like this like gold card, you know? <laughs> the, the kid gold card yes. for writing rated R movies. Um, so it, it, I have to admit, like, I was such a slasher kid and it really wasn't until I got into my like kind of early teens, maybe mid teens. And I started really like getting into other types of horror, you know, like whether it was zombies or classics and things like that, you know, it took a little sure. while for me to get, you know, start watching all the other stuff, but definitely those very early years, uh, was focused on slashers because I, I didn't even today. I just if it's a slasher, I will watch it because it, it, no matter how bad it is, it's just I don't know. Just I love yeah. that trope. Sure. Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. I'm still catching up on a lot of the ones that I missed from that time period because I'm like, wow, how ma- how many of them were there? My God. Every time, like, a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like a lot of these streaming sites are like, oh, from the 80s. I'm like, what? What? When? How did I yeah. miss this? And yeah, I mean, there were a ton of them. Um, yeah. So so instead of um, getting involved in the horror genre as you got older, you started off as a graphic designer. Um, you have so how how did you become interested in that? What was the what was the spark? So I've always I've always been a creative type person. You know, as a kid, I, I used to draw a lot, and I used to I remember having these Manila folders with lined paper inside each one, and each Manila folder had the title of a different book on them. Like I was going to write seven books or something. You know, like yeah. it, it just because I had ideas and I didn't know how to express them. So um, and then I you know I started playing music and I, I sang all through school and choirs and stuff. So. Uh, and in my, you know, my, my family is a very musical family and also I would say somewhat artistic as well. Um, so anyway, I just, that was just 
the thing that I, I just loved creating something, but I didn't know what to create, you know? And I took a lot of art classes in school. I mean, my whole high school was spent mostly in the art room, you know, other than my other required classes. Definitely my senior year, I was just in the art room the whole time. And um, I just was in love with the idea of not only making art, but like design. And at the time, this was pre-computer for graphic design. There was a lot of cut paste type stuff, um, like actual cut paste, not, not control. Yeah. Being control <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and I liked the idea, but I was never a good technical person when it came to like really being technical about line work and stuff as you really kind of have to be in the graphic design. And so I went to college right out of high school to become a filmmaker. That was, I was originally going to be an illustrator and then I wanted to be a filmmaker and then I dropped out after a year and I went to work uh, for Kodak for two years. And oh, during wow. that time, yeah, I had gotten, I, I got like a bootleg version of Photoshop, you know, like a mm -hmm. downloaded version. And I would spend nights at my house, you know, so still in my parents' time, I would be up all night working on designs with Photoshop, not really realizing that what I was doing was essentially graphic design. Like I would design album covers for the mix CDs I was making or wow. just all these things. And I realized like I really like combining photos and typography and things. So I decided that I needed to go back to school. So when I should have been entering my senior year of college, I actually started over and went started out as a freshman at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology here. They have a wonderful graphic design program. And I went through all four years. And it was an amazing experience to learn so many things. I During that time, I got to um, study abroad in Germany at the Bauhaus for five months, which was amazing. Um, and just learned a lot over those four years. And it was a good foundation uh, for, for, the, for what I was, well, ultimately what I'm doing now, I guess. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. That's great. I'd love to sometime uh, another time get into that a little bit more. That's really interesting. Um, sure. Yeah. So, um, as far as Fright Rag, so what was what? When did it hit you that this was something that you wanted to create, and was becoming an entrepreneur something that you always saw yourself becoming? So it was around 2003, and I graduated uh, from college in 2002, and. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, you know, we were going to be moving in together as soon as I got a job at a school and I did that summer and we moved in together and we had an apartment and we, you know, we were looking to get married and all that stuff. And she had a good job here. And, um, but you know, we were in an apartment, we didn't have kids yet. We weren't married. We didn't, you know, we didn't have a lot of the extra stuff and stresses, you know, that we do now. Um, so I had a lot of extra time and I'd found this job. It was a really really great job starting out because it was a small company. I was literally the third person hired on. So I worked right next to the owner and the office manager and it was a laptop bag design company. And I didn't design the actual bags, but I did the product photography. I updated the website. I did the print collateral. I did like, I was wearing a lot of hats, which is a lot of fun because otherwise, you know, I just didn't want to get bored. But at the same time, it was all for the same type of product. So that does get a little creatively stifling at times. Yeah. And during that time, you know, this is pre Facebook, pre MySpace, pre all this stuff, there were, you know, message boards. And I would spend a lot of time on horror message boards talking to other fans. And, you know, I'd been doing that for a few years at that point. But a few of the ones that I was on uh, were, were creators, like fan made hockey mask for you know jason hockey master michael myers mask my buddy justin mabry who went on to start trick-or-treat studios he had a great forum called night owl forums and i was even a mod on that forum he and i became really close uh during that time and i just felt this desire to like do something like what can i do and i again i wasn't going to be sculpting masks even I, I had tried that when i was a kid but i mean i wasn't going to be like justin or all these other guys or make freddy gloves like anders uh from nightmare gloves you know all these people that were so amazing at their craft so i'm like what can i do and i weirdly enough i've always been interested in like weird t-shirts like if we go on vacations i had to pick out like the right t-shirt for me and it, it had to be like it just fit this weird sensibility that i had you know mm -hmm. whether whatever it was and I like the kind of like the, the, the skate culture and BMX culture when I was a kid and loved loved the logos and things with those companies like Airwalk or Ball or, you know, Fucked and all those, you know, companies. So uh, F-U-C-T, by the way, not. The, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, sorry, this is a family show. I wasn't no, trying okay. to swear. But, um, and so I basically I, I thought, you know, what 
I don't have any horror t-shirts. I had one from Anchor Bay. It was a Halloween shirt from, I think, when uh, uh, they had released the VHS on, on, in 98. Um, but I didn't have anything that was horror related. And I did a quick search online. And the only place I could find that really had you know, any decent shirts was Rotten Cotton. And I know they had been around for a while. And I liked what he was doing. But it wasn't. It didn't speak to me as a fan in terms of what I wanted to wear at the time. So I just started coming up with these ideas and I came up with this graphic of uh, Jason's hockey mask from part six, but it was just stark white, um, very, very basic. But I thought it looked cool. Like if I just had that on a shirt, that would be neat. And then this was around the time when the what would Jesus do craze was all everywhere. That's all you saw, bumper stickers and stuff. Oh, and yeah. I thought, well, what if I put that hockey mask where the J was and it just said, what would Jason do, right? <laughs> and it, it just, it made me laugh. And I thought, there's no way this has not been done before. So I was Google searching everything. And I couldn't find any evidence of it. I'm like, you know what? That looks cool. So talking to Justin from Night Owl, he said, hey, these are cool. You should post them on my forum. I'm like, are you okay with me doing that? He goes, I'll do it. I'll make a post for you. I'm like, that's awesome. I didn't want to like, like spam his board sure, with my yeah. stuff. And people just started posting like, oh my God, that you know, I would love to have that as a shirt and blah, blah, blah. And it was this interesting, like positive feedback or just any feedback, to be honest with you, that I'd not yet ever, it was always, I was always isolated. You know, I'd make it on my own, but it was no one to show to. And I just thought, okay. I have a little bit of experience making websites from college, so I'm just going to try to think of something. Maybe, you know, when I start, started coming up with names, I'm like, Fright Rag sounds cool. Let me buy the domain name and let me set up a website. And I've never linked a PayPal buy button to a site before. And, of course, everything's hand-coded. And I remember sitting at my desk at, at my job, and I loaded. I was buying the shirts initially from customink.com, and it was going to be like 10 bucks a shirt, which is crazy. It's one color. Yeah. And, um I'm sitting there and I wanted to buy 20 shirts of each design. So there's three designs. The other, the third one was a Michael Myers one. And uh, it was like 600 bucks. And I did not have $600. I had a credit card and my wife and I were, you know, we were planning a wedding. And I, I just remember hovering over the buy now button. Like, am I going to, what am I doing? Like, what, what is possessing me to like spend all this money that I don't have on a, on a website and business that I, I don't even know what I'm doing. So I clicked it, got the shirts, and I put them up. It was actually 18 years ago this month. And um, wow. and so in terms of wanting to become an entrepreneur, it really never – that wasn't the impetus for what I was doing. It was – honestly, the website and the shirts, it was just more like a vehicle that have you know a place for someone to go to buy them um, because nowadays, I mean, it's so easy. But back then, you, know, you had to really kind of create it yourself, you know? Yeah. And uh, it – it really wasn't to start this big business and, and whatever. Honestly, I wanted it to be my livelihood, but I never thought it could be that, you know, that yeah. was the dream, but that was just like that pie in the sky. Like, Oh, wouldn't it be amazing if I could quit my job and do this for a living? And you know, and here so you it, are. Was, it was never, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> here I am. That is amazing. Um, so, I mean, so I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot of like what you're saying, right? You're hovering over the buy button and you're sitting there going, is this, is, is this a reality? Um, at what point though, I mean, there, there's a point where you just go, I'm, I'm all in, I'm doing it. How, how, how after that point in time, did you just say, okay, I'm all in on Fright Rags now. This is going to be a business and I'm going to run this thing and I'm going to sell shirts. So there were a couple times that, I can recall things kind of clicking for me. So the first one was in uh, 2005. It was, uh, so this was only barely a year and a half after I started. It was early 2005. And I remember I, I was sort of getting disenchanted with my job and I was kind of brushing up my, my resume um, and thinking I could just maybe just go work somewhere else. But I had all these Fright Rags designs I wanted to do. And I was on my way home from work and it was snowing and I was stuck in traffic. It took forever. And I was literally talking to myself. And I'm like, you know, if I could wake up tomorrow and make the same amount of money that I'm making right now, but either be at a different job or doing fright rags, what one would I pick? Because at the time, there was no way I was gonna be able to quit my job and do fright rags full time. I just wasn't, I wasn't even paying myself. This was mm -hmm. just a hobby. Sure, yeah. And so, but I had to take that off the table. I said, well, what if I woke up tomorrow and I had the choice? And immediately I just, it's fright rags. Like that's, this is what I want to do. And then that made me, it forced me to kind of realize that is my path. And 
from that point on, I, I really kind of started focusing in and just pushing it. And then two years later, so it was 2007, it was the summer, we were visiting some friends in Boston and my friend was asking me how the business is going. I'm like, yeah, it's going really you know, good. He goes, can't you quit your job now? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't even know how, I don't, I, I don't even understand like how that would work. You know what I mean? Like I, I, cause I, again, I wasn't paying myself. I was just operating this company by myself. I hadn't had any employees at the time or anything. So, and I just had my first child and so I said, you know, this is what I'm going to do. And at the time, it's so funny because we're going back, what, 14 years. Online mm-hmm. savings accounts were like 5% interest, which is like ridiculous, right? Like yeah. now you're lucky to get like 0.2%. But <laughs> yes. I said, all right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start up this online savings account through a uh, bank that I have no other accounts with, no affiliation with. And I'm going to take out of my Fright Rags money the money that I make every week at my job and I'm going to have it automatically deposited into that account every Friday. And I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to keep doing what I do. And I, I set it up and I started realizing after a couple months that I could still run the business. I could still make the shirts I wanted to make and, you know, whatever, buy the inventory or do whatever I needed to do. And yet I was continually saving a weekly paycheck and it was gaining interest. So I kind of let that ride for like five months or so. And then there was an opportunity that came up at a design firm that I I actually really liked. It was this really small design firm, which was run by uh, this woman named Kathy and she had like an office manager and that was it. Um, She never had any openings, but she had an opening for like an entry level part-time designer. And I applied and and she was sort of like, well, you're kind of overqualified for this. I'm like, (laughs) I don't care. I just want part-time work. So I I think I want to quit my job. And I ended up quitting my full-time job in March of 2008 and started working for her like, you know, 15, 20 hours a week while doing Fright Rags. And then in only about four or five months, I had to quit that because I was just too busy. And at that point, I, you know, I had had what at that point, probably eight or nine months of income saved up in an, in an account that I wasn't touching and I could and, and I could quit my job and just start paying myself what I was making. And it was pretty wild. <laughs> what is that feeling like for those? Cause I mean, there's so many of us out there that are, you know, they're doing the daily grind and they're always doing mm-hmm. the what if and the mm-hmm. man, if I just could, Oh, if I only as someone who has done it and you have moved from working for someone to working for yourself, what is that feeling like? how 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 it just express that to everybody out there to because i'm sure there are people out there that are like i want to try it i want to maybe this will help push them over the edge can you express what that was like yeah i mean it's it's definitely it's incredibly freeing but it's also very scary in fact the day that i even when i quit my part-time job i was actually worried that for whatever reason I would just start slipping and I wouldn't be as disciplined. I just, I guess I thought for some reason I would wake up the next day and just sit around eating cereal and watching movies or something like, Mm -hmm. you know, that never happened. I mean, believe me, you know, it, it just, for some reason I was worried that I didn't, I wasn't going to be as hungry for it because I kind of attained my goal, if that makes sense. Yeah. But what I found was that it was the opposite. It was like, I am flying solo now there's no net under me yep there's nothing not that uh, listen security is hard to find in any job these days but there's still something for working for somebody versus working yourself that you i mean it stops with you you know what I mean? <laughs> like yeah. and especially now that i have employees it's even more you know there's way more responsibility for me but um it but it, i'll tell you it feels pretty amazing when you wake up and you're like wait a minute I am my own boss. But if you start relishing in that and basically take it for granted, it's going to fall apart. Like that is my fuel to keep going and be like, hey, it's on you. So get it done. Like figure it out because yeah. no one else is going to do it for well, you. Well, you're that person that we're very similar this way. Is It's called fear of failure. Mm-hmm. And, you, you know, we all... We're, Everybody out there has that fear, you know, we're afraid of the unknown or afraid of, you know, trying something different or afraid of breaking the routine. But 
there are some that have a fear of failure that motivates them. So like what you're saying, you're like, you wake up the next day and you're like, oh my gosh, it's just me. Uh, you know, I have no net. Uh, I could, you know, I, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm probably going to turn on TV and sit around and do nothing all day. But you're that person that's like, no, I, I'm afraid of that happening. So I'm going to yeah. go out there and work even harder now. And, you know, I get that way with certain things too, where I'll get into something and I'll be like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I really have to like, I really have to focus and bring my A game and I have a fear of failure as well. So, but I've never started a company, so I cannot compare myself to you in that fashion. <laughs> well, but it, it's, I mean, it's similar. Like I, I definitely have that fear of failure and, and I'll tell you, like, no matter, we always talk about at the office, like we're only as good as our last release. You know, and and I appreciate when people, you know, have some compliments for us and all these things. And it feels wonderful. But I always look at it as this can go away tomorrow. So I, I never I never look at it as something that's just is there and take it for granted. I'm like, uh, this is a really good thing. Don't screw it up. This could go all this could all be a dream and you wake up tomorrow and it's gone. So you need to make, you need to work at it, you know, yeah. like that's constantly the internal dialogue that I have with myself where, you know, it's, again, it's nice to pat yourself on the back and sit back and look at what you've accomplished over years or whatever. But then it's like, okay, on to the next thing, because there has to be a next thing. And if there's not, there's a problem. Yeah, no, I totally hear that. I mean, cause it is, it's, and I think, I think we've seen this more, um, growing up because we, we come from the gen, the, that generation of, uh, watching our parents and grandparents and uh, kind of it's like, oh, you, you work for the company and you work there for 25 mm -hmm. years and then you retire and then you, your pension. Yeah. Whereas now it's like, oh, you work for this company for two years and then you move to that company and you work there for six months and then you go over there and you do this. And then, oh, by the way, technology is changing. So everything yeah. you just did the last five years doesn't even exist anymore. Now you have to learn something new. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I totally understand because who knows? I mean, you're doing this right now in 10 years. You could be doing something totally different that's successful going, wow, you know what? I started off doing fright rags and now I'm off doing this and it's just as successful. So no, I hear what you're saying. Um, what's interesting with, um, with your company when I, when I look at it is that, um, you're, I'm assuming that you're dealing with studios or whoever owns the, the rights to these properties, whether it's the movie, the franchises. So who did you target first when you decided to do this? Um, and how did that conversation go? Well, it, it's funny that the very first license I ever got was, way back in the beginning was like a month after I, I think it was like a month after I started it. Maybe it was a few months after, but, um, I, I already, okay. So I always knew that I would have to get some sort of licensing someday. Like I knew that was the appropriate path to take, but I had zero idea of how to do that. I had zero money. And so, you know, for a long time, it was just, I'm going to create a shirt based on my bloody Valentine or the prowler or whatever. And to be completely honest, you know, I've gotten caught and I've gotten cease and desist. I got a cease and desist for what would Jason do um, from New Line Cinemas. And I had to change the mask to make it look like some sort of weird alien mask. And, and that ended up selling pretty darn good and hot topic, like bought 8,000 of them that year, which is pretty crazy. Um, but um, so very, very early on, I had found one of my favorite slashers, actually, Sleepaway Camp 2 and 3. I like the original, but 2 and 3 are great. Um, and I just, I wanted to, to do official shirts. So I found the director who owned the property and he granted me the license, which was awesome. And we still have that today. And so there were a couple of small properties that I did get the rights to throughout the years, but then it really wasn't until maybe 2010, 2011, we started working with tops to do Mars tax. And then shortly after that in 2012, uh, we got Evil Dead 2, which was a really big deal for me. Um, and then since then, it's just been kind of just growing and growing and growing and then to the point where everything is officially licensed from us. So, and I'm not trying to delve into your, you know, your, <clears throat> I'm not trying to delve into your business, like, you know, like yeah. opening the books or anything. But what, no, what, I'm, curi yeah. what I'm curious about is in terms of like, so let's just say like Evil Dead 2. So mm -hmm. you guys t are talking and they say, okay, fine, Ben, we're going to give you the licensing rights for Evil Dead 2. Is it, is it over a period of time? Is it, is it like, we'll give it to you for six months, for a year in perpetuity? H how, like, how does something like that work? So in general, uh, and just using general terms, yes. most, most contracts are pretty similar uh, for the most part in terms of how they're constructed. And that is contracts are generally two years. And basically you, 
start with an advance against royalties. So just to kind of make it like an easy math, yeah. if we have to pay $5,000 for a 10% royalty, that means um, the, the $5,000 is an advance. So as soon as we gross, uh, our gross sales of those products are over 50,000, um, because 5,000 is 10% of 50,000, um, then we start paying 10% off of each item sold. So the 5,000 kind of covers us for the first 50,000, again, based gotcha. on 12, 10% royalty. Okay. So um, that's the advance and then you get the contract. There's tons of other stuff that ends up going into these things and there's business insurance, you have to carry them on your insurance for liability and all this other stuff. Um, and it, it also, it doesn't give you carte blanche in what you can do with the license. A lot of times there's stipulations. You might not be able to use certain actors likenesses. They might have approval on their likeness. There's so many other variables, but that's pretty standard across the board. Some contracts you can negotiate a longer term, some contracts you can negotiate, you know, uh, just a, a variety of, of factors, but that's, that's pretty basic. Gotcha. Yeah. I was always curious about that. Cause I, I, I know like the stuff, especially nowadays, right? Everything, everything is, you know, has to have contracts and I mean, it makes sense, but uh, I was, I was very curious about this. Thank you for, 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 uh, enlightening, uh, me on that. Cause that's really, that's a really interesting thing. I always like the behind the scenes stuff on that. Cause it's, it's just, you know, I, I, I'm very curious that way. Um, so, um, when you started this, um, were there any complications or obstacles that you came across that maybe you weren't anticipating or did everything kind of go according to plan <laughs> every single day? And it's so funny because, um, a friend of mine recently told me new levels, new devils, because <laughs> it's, it, it's so true that at least in my experience, every time we've, we've done anything or grown or, or I mean, so many things, it is a constant learning experience. So to give you an example, um, so no, I mean, it, in terms of things going smoothly, the things just kind of went and I had to figure stuff out. Like I had no idea what I was doing. Like, for example, early in the, early in, uh, when we were, so I was always direct consumer and I always liked being direct consumer, but back in 2005, 2006, um, hot topic was interested in selling some of our designs. And that was a really cool thing, even though it was a lot of work cause I didn't have any other companies to do this for me. So it was literally once I, um, after custom ink, that first order that I was telling you about, I went to this screen printer it was right around the corner from my work. He worked out of his garage and we used him for like five years, like exclusively. And so everything was done out of this guy's garage. So when hot topic orders, like a uh, several thousand shirts and they need them in three weeks and you have to not only print them, but fold them and tag them and put them in certain box orders with certain labels. And they have to get picked up by a truck and all the stuff. And you're like, um, how am I going to do this? I have a 60 page manual I have to read and figure out in three weeks. Right. <laughs> so that's one hurdle. And then it's like literally throwing yourself in fire and I'll never forget. It. it was 2005. We had done our first order for hot topic. It was a Nosferatu t-shirt and they, of course, these companies, they're net, usually net 60, which means they pay 60 days after they get the goods. So we have to front everything. Right. And again, at the time I had zero money. So I'm like figuring out ways, with credit cards, like my mom and, and my wife drove three and a half hours to buy the blank t-shirts just wow. to get them here. It was crazy. So, um, and that was one way they had to drive like seven hours that day. It was crazy <laughs> just to get blank t-shirts. So yep. I got this check in the mail, hot topic paid me. And it said two fright rags, $12,000. I'd never seen a check that big in my life at the time. Right. And I'm like, Holy crap, this is great. And now I had a separate account for fright rags, uh, with the bank that I had my personal money in. And it was just another account that I opened up. That's where I kept my fright rags money. It was new. It was new year's Eve. I get to the bank. I needed to deposit that money that day so I could pay off my credit cards, all the stuff. And the, the cashier or the, the person at the desk, she was like, well, what's fright rags i'm like oh it's, that's my business and she's like well i don't have a name fright rags on this this oh checking account. no and i'm like no but it's me and she's like well you have to have your business name you have to have a dba and i'm like what the hell is a dba she's like it's doing business as name i'm like how do i get that and she's like the county clerk i'm like where's the county clerk i don't even know what that means <laughs> and she like told me and I like had to run downtown, get in line, pay 30 bucks, fill out a form, run back to the bank and deposit the check. <laughs> and I had not known any of this stuff. And so that's just one of probably a thousand examples of, of things that come up. You know, obviously I've learned a lot over the years and there's so much 
more experience I have now. And then and I look back and kind of laugh, but then, you know, something happens. You're like, wait, what does this mean? And you got to start researching and asking questions and figuring it out. So I've literally been just trying to figure stuff out for the last 18 years. That is, that is great. That's, <laughs> I think we've all experienced something like that, right? It's like, oh, hey, today's going to be a great day. And all of a sudden <laughs> your day turns into a, a nightmare oh, of running. It, <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, always, always. Like, I just had one of those days last week, seriously, like, where things just went, like, completely wrong, where we thought we had something nailed down with a supplier, and it went to crap. And I was like, what are we going to do? <laughs> like, oh, my God. <laughs> so we had to figure it out. But, you know, it's – those are the, the battle scars, right? Yeah. That's – that. I mean, that's that's being a businessman, right? I mean, you're out there doing your thing, and it's like, okay – like you say, the buck stops with you. So when everybody, everybody's like, we don't know what to do. They all look at you. It's like, all right, we'll figure this out. I mean, it's, yep. yeah. Um, when it comes to the design concepts um, for the shirt. So like if you, um, like for Halloween or for uh, one of your new ones, Return to Living Dead, which uh, which just came out. Congratulations. Um, how, how, how are the designs created? Is it something that, that they bring to you or is it something that they say create something for us? How does that work? So it it happens in a lot of different ways. So we have a few kind of our stable artists, if you will, Um, Justin Osborne, Kyle Crawford. Those guys are always churning out work for us. We keep them busy. And for for those two in particular, yeah, once in a while we'll we'll have ideas. So our production manager, Chris, and myself are the ones that usually sit down and kind of hash out things. Obviously, anybody else who has an idea or wants to see something can throw their you know idea. And I'm I'm not I'm not opposed to taking ideas from anybody you know who wants to offer them. We'll talk about it. it's an open thing, but usually he and I are the ones that are setting the schedule. So we kind of look things and he'll be like, Hey, what about an idea doing this? And be like, Hey, that sounds awesome. Let's do it. But with Kyle and Justin, there's a lot of times where we're like, listen, um, return to living dead. We want to do a long sleeve. We kind of want it to look punk go. And then they'll submit, you know, maybe one, maybe four concepts, you know, and then we'll choose the one we want to run with the best or, Oh, you know, I like that one, but change the color on that one or tweak this here and there. Sometimes we go to the artist with a fully fledged idea. Sometimes I'll even do a really bad sketch of it just to kind of show them what I'm thinking and then they'll turn it into something amazing. Um, so it's it, it ha- it's a very uh, fluid process, but I love, see, I like working with artists that I admire so much where I'm like, I want to see what you can do with Halloween and here's the limitations. You know, we can't use this person or whatever. And I want to see what they come up with first. I don't want to have to dictate to people all the time because I want them to kind of be creative. Right. That's what I love about their work. But at the same time, there are times where it's like, oh, my God, we got to do this, this idea or this design. And, And we kind of already have this idea in mind, but we still let the artist sort of take it from there and create something that they have input in. So. Um, very rarely am I actually doing any of the actual design work myself anymore, just because, I mean, listen, as much as I was a graphic designer, I was not like awesome. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Like I wasn't a really good illustrator. I can put things together and I think I was able to craft my eye for things in school, but I don't know that I was ever really good enough to like do a lot of the like amazing work that a lot of our artists do like i can look at it and know what to tweak and have a certain like direction for it if need be but other than that i just love working with really creative people it it really is an amazing thing well you can tell i mean you can tell you you obviously you have graphics design background you're you have an artist art artist background you're around artists and you, you could just tell when you when i'm on your site right now i mean for those that are not familiar with your website they're not familiar with your product i mean here are the titles that they have you know that fright rex currently has on their website you know this is just a, a small little snippet evil dead the halloween franchise science of the lambs uh shawn of the dead nightbreed um, uh, the thing, Mandy, Twin Peaks. Uh, you have the Universal Monster Collection, uh, Garbage Pail Kids. What I also like too is that even though that it's called Fright Rags, you also have stuff like Highlander and uh, <laughs> Back to the Future on here, um, among you know so many other things. Um, looking at September, September was a really nice month for you guys. Um, you had um, Return to Living Dead, 
Mm-hmm. You had um, what? You had more creep show items come out, right? Because I think you had stuff last year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, for the we, we basically time it for um, we do we do creep show movie stuff. We also do for the TV show. So this year um, for the new season premiere, we've got the new creep show stuff coming up for the for I think the premiere is is it next week? Am I thinking right? Um, I'm losing track. Yeah, I'm or losing, is it this week? It might be. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm kind of yeah I'm, I'm yeah I don't know. <laughs> Actually, I gotta look that up. <laughs> Um, and then e- the email just came out today about um, Elvira. You now have officially yeah. licensed 40th anniversary Elvira. Why don't you tell everybody how, how that came to be? So I started working with Elvira back in 2017. We had, um, I think I had reached out to her manager or something. Uh, it could be he reached out to me. I don't even remember how it began, but we basically um, got on the phone and started talking and so uh and got a licensing deal and she's she's awesome she um i've gotten i've gotten to meet her a few times and and luckily like the the few times nowadays that she actually dresses up as elvira for photo ops i've gotten a a few pictures with her which is great and she was so kind enough to shoot like a promo commercial for us uh, a few years ago um, and i was there filming it i mean next to her while she was filming it was just so cool like She's been great, um, and 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 Scott, her manager, has been great. They they're really good about like promoting our stuff on their pages, which is really cool. Because a lot of times, especially with big studios, they're not in tune with a lot of that stuff. You're getting a license, and they're approving it, or, you know, your designs, but they're not involved in the marketing. Whereas Scott and Elfire really take, you know, they love doing that stuff, and they're they're always promoting our stuff and other people's, you know, stuff, not just ours, but you know, a lot of other people that have licenses, they promote it, and I, that's really cool to me because they take they take pride in all that, which I mean, they yeah. should, I, I would hope, but I mean, it's nice to see it, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. That is so cool. Um, I'm looking right now on your site. You have, which is really cool. The, um, Halloween two Haddonfield <laughs> Memorial hospital jacket. How, how did that whole idea come about? So a number of years ago, I think it was around 2007, 2008, there was a friend of mine who I knew from the Halloween forums back in the day, and he was making these jackets on his own. He would make, you know, he would get the patches done and, and he would sell these things like, I don't know, because it wasn't Etsy at the time. I, he was just selling them on forums or something. And I bought two jackets from him. One was like a cool same type of jacket, but it had like Halloween two patches on it, like on um, the skull and like the actual Halloween two name and ever. But then I really wanted the 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 replica hmh jacket and he does those so i bought one from him and i literally wear it every year around fall time like it's the it really is a it's 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 oddly lightweight and very warm at the same time so as we were approaching the 40th anniversary of halloween 2 this year um well we were thinking about it last year into this year i'm like i want to make a fully licensed version of this jacket but I don't want to really change anything. I mean, I got to get the patches made. I really want to use the same type of red cap jacket. Like I really wanted to, to be able to market this in a wider way that it's officially licensed, you know? Um, and we were thinking, cause we had done the hoodies before we had done hoodies that looked like that, but they were just zip up hoodies and we had the name patch on the front, but it wasn't a patch. It was screen printed. And you know, we did some bud ones. We did some Jimmy ones. And when we were talking about the jacket idea, I said, you know, I don't, really think it's going to be good for us to try to do some bud and some jimmy it's just going to be kind of a pain um because these patches are sewn on and uh liz in our group she's like what if you did like velcro and you had velcro patches and i'm like oh my god that's brilliant like that's like that is awesome but we got to make sure it's the right velcro and so we tested out a couple things and we realized like this can work if we if we sew the um the loop part to the softer part of the Velcro to the, the name, you know, to the jacket, the hook parts can be, you know, Bud and Jimmy will include both patches. And these things like are stuck on there. It's a really heavy duty Velcro. Um, so it's not just going to like peel right off. And, you know, if, if people wanted to make their own patch, they could do that too. And then Velcro down there. So it's, it's, it was a fun way to solve that problem. Like, are we going to do Bud or Jimmy? And, I, it was just kind of a neat idea, and I, I credit Liz with that for sure. It's very cool. And speaking of Halloween, it's uh, it's never a bad thing to have uh, Jamie Lee Curtis sporting one of your shirts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How how awesome was that? Uh, 
amazing. Like she's, she's just so cool. And, um, we were actually put in touch with her. I, I got to meet her in person a couple of years ago on the set of Halloween kills. That was an ex- crazy experience. Um, we talked very briefly and, and I actually didn't even like introduce myself. I was just sitting around and talking to her. So it was just weird. But then I was put uh, in touch with her last year to, um, to donate. Uh, she was, she saw our Halloween lunch boxes. She actually shared it on Instagram and I was like, wow, that's crazy. Cause it wasn't even anything like we were promoting it, but I don't know how she saw it, maybe a hashtag or something. And she promoted it. And we're friends with like, uh, producers from the movies and obviously the, the people who own Michael Myers and she was actually wearing our Michael Myers face mask at the VMAs last year I think was it last year um, when she won her Lifetime Achievement Award I was one I was the, the the maybe not the VMAs it was the MTV Movie Awards and anyway we were put in touch with her uh, through one of our producers through another producers to, to send her some lunch boxes to donate I'm like yeah just let me know how many you need and we sent her a bunch and we just included a bunch of stuff in this box for her and uh which is great because then she was wearing one of our shirts in the video which That's I did awesome. not expect and it was it was a really cool surprise talk about coming full circle I mean could could, oh could you I mean 40 years ago <laughs> telling your yourself your four-year-old self hey one of these days she's gonna be wearing one of your shirts I can't even, that is something I can't describe in words, like really, truly. I mean, just even, yeah, just being on the set, even with Halloween Kills and watching her act and watching like David Gordon Green direct while he's wearing our Halloween jacket, you know, and like, it was trippy, you know, and even being fortunate to meet so many people from that film and other films over the years. I mean, we had PJ souls up. She's become such a good friend of mine over the years. And like, we can just, you know, text each other and call each other, whatever. And we had her up here, um, in 2017 for a, to show Halloween. We do local screenings here, uh, every month. Well, pre COVID and we're starting to get back to it. And we, we, sometimes we Skype in people from the movies if we can get the contact info. But in this case, we brought PJ in and it was her and her boyfriend rob and it was a sold out crowd and everyone got to meet her or whatever and we were up in the balcony and it was just just in the balcony it was a very small balcony in this theater it was just her and rob and me and my wife and then below us was the sold out crowd we were watching my own 35 millimeter print of halloween i have an original print of it and i'm like i don't understand my life right now like this is it's like i was stepping outside of myself and i'm like i just as a fan, like as a fan, I'm like, what is happening right now? This is bonkers. <laughs> like, I can't believe it. And we even shot a short film with PJ in it. And I got to play Michael Myers and we premiered it that night. Um, it was just so much fun. It was just, it, it's just, yeah, it's wild. That is awesome. That really is. Well, I had mentioned to you before the interview that I am wearing one of your shirts and I'm not lying. I am wearing one of your shirts and um, I I would say guess, but you have so many. (laughs) So we could be here for hours. Um, So I'll just cut to the chase. So I am wearing the uh, Halloween uh, World Television premiere shirt. Um, As soon as I saw this on your site, I'm like, I need to have that because it takes me back to being a kid. I'm a big fan of uh, a lot of memorabilia like that, even if it's like TV spots on on YouTube. Like I'm addicted to that stuff, um, old newspaper clippings. Um, so this shirt is awesome. And one of the things I really love too is not not only how now I'm doing a promo for your for your <laughs> for your shirts. <laughs> not only is it soft, um, it's so comfortable, <laughs> which it is. Um, I also love the fact that you put the uh, you don't have a tag on the back; you have it printed on the back. Um, and you even have like for the Halloween collection, um, it has, uh, has like, it's like tailor made for the Halloween collection. It's really, really cool. There's a lot of quality that, that is on this shirt. Um, even, even going down to the stuff is like the little tag in the back and stuff. So these, if you've not purchased one of these, you should seriously consider one of these cause, or several, um, I'm eyeing the night of living dead shirt right now, actually, as we're, as we're talking, um, this is just great. This has been fantastic. Um, uh, it's been great having you on, Ben. Thank you so much for joining me here. Um, obviously, uh, the website is fright, F R I G H T dash or hyphen rags, R A G S dot com. Um, if anybody wants to follow you or, um, or the company on other social media, do you guys have that? Yeah. So we're pretty much everywhere. Um, Instagram and Twitter is just at fright rags. So that's all one word, um, the at fright rags. And then, um, we're on Facebook, you know, facebook.com uh, dash bright rags. 
uh, that's we were on TikTok a little bit, um, just kind of poking around, having fun with it. But uh, most of it's Instagram and Twitter that, you know, I, I'm I run the Twitter account myself, like in terms of like anybody who's posting on Twitter, it's me. <laughs> um, I mean, our releases, we kind of set up, you know, and, and have those posted automatically. But everybody else is just everything else on Twitter is just me. And then Instagram, I mean, we we kind of all take turns just posting stuff. I mean, Joe, who's our basically like our kind of art director and, and, and website guy I mean everything he's the kind of jack of all trades he and and Chris and myself we think of posts to put on Instagram and stuff but I mean I'm on Instagram all the time checking DMs and all those things so um, and you know obviously people in customer service are taking care of those issues too so um, but yeah we're, we're pretty much on, on all platforms well listen Ben thank you so much for joining me on the program this was awesome this is really fantastic i really thank you uh for taking the time to come on here and thanks for uh hanging in there with me as i was trying to juggle this interview time so listen i really appreciate it. this is this is this was really fantastic um really would love to have you come back on the program uh again uh, uh down the road as well thanks so much for coming on the show sure thanks for having me it's a, definitely a pleasure being here. pleasure being here pleasure being here and as I put this interview to rest, I really want to thank uh, Ben for being on the program. Um, I had to reschedule this interview a bunch of times, and he was awesome about rolling with it. Uh, so, you know, these things unfortunately happen, um, but in this case, it was a little bit more, <laughs> this is a little crazier than normal. I've, sometimes I've had to push a guest maybe twice. Uh, this was like a bunch of times. So he was awesome. I cannot thank him enough for, for rolling with it. And this exceeded anything that I expected uh, with this interview. What a really cool guy. Um, what great stuff uh, that he shared with us. Um, just great stuff. And um, yeah, again, uh, Fright Rags, uh, it's Fright, F-R-I-G-H-T hyphen R-A-G-S dot com. Check it out. Great stuff. And I really am wearing uh, the Halloween shirt. I'm not lying. I do have it here. Um, so there you go. Uh, really quickly, um, the uh, Graveyard Show podcast uh, YouTube channel for the longest time was exclusive home to some of my older shows. Um, they were um, edited versions of my old uh, Graveyard Show podcasts from 2009 to 2010. And they're called GYS Classic, otherwise known as Graveyard Show Classic. And these are just episodes where I, instead of doing anything new with them, I just went in, got the interview, uh, edited the beginning of the show and edited the end of the show and just put it up there uh, for you to listen to. Well, for the longest time, they've been exclusive just to the YouTube channel, but I figured, you know what, these things are podcasts. So they're, they're obviously meant for audio as opposed to video. So I've opted now to start uploading those uh, to um, the Graveyard Show podcast site as well. So if you're a subscriber to the Graveyard Show podcast, um, you probably already got the alert that these have been uploaded. So I've uh, uh, uploaded the first three of the GYS Classic episodes. The first one is with Raina Young, who, of course, is Miss Misery, the queen of Bay Area horror. Um, then Stacy Ponder is GYS Classic number two. Um, she's an author, um, a writer, a blogger. Um, she came on um, to talk about uh, just movies and her filmmaking and um, women in horror. And then the third um, GYS Classic that is uploaded is the uh, director, Faden Papa Michael, who uh, was on promoting his film From Within, which uh, back in 2009 was one of the eight films to die for. Faden, of course, is a very, very famous director of photography um, in TV and movies. And uh, he came on to promote his film as well. So those are great. I have several others getting ready to come up. So just wanted to let you know, uh, they will be labeled GYS Classic. And uh, I have a whole bunch more that will be coming up as well. So the only exclusive home for the Graveyard Show podcast um, is uh, Catacombs of Horror, which is actually a video um, production. And uh, you can check those out on Graveyard Show podcast uh, on YouTube. Um, of course, Graveyard Show podcast is found everywhere podcasts exist. Uh, again, if you'd like to follow the program on Slasher, you can do so at Graveyard Show Podcast. And the email address is gyspodcast at gmail.com. Uh, if you know anyone who's a fan of horror, please invite them to enter the graveyard. New listeners and friends are always welcome. All right, my friends. Well, let's gear up for Halloween. The next time we will meet will be in the month of October. And what a fun month that's going to be. Uh, in the meantime, I look forward to seeing you again. And of course, 
As you exit the graveyard, I would like to remind you to please lock the gate behind you. We wouldn't want anyone to get out. Until next time. Thank you.